this is like an annual gala that you have? Yeah, every year. Are we in here now? Uh, as far as I know, yes. I've, I've been here only once before. Yeah. So let me show you, and then you can come back and actually videotape it. Oh, if you okay, want to know okay, exactly, okay. I'll just direct you to where it is.
Senior Curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, England. Dr. Sheena Iyengar from the Columbia Business School. And last but not least, the Honorable Vim Kocher, the President and Founder of the Vilma Group of Companies and the first Indo-Canadian appointed to the Senate of Canada. After a decadent and delicious After a decadent and delicious dinner, we will dance the night away to the eclectic sounds of Black Mahal and DJ NRK. My name is Sir Robert Aliwal, and I will be your host for the evening. <laughs> Evening's running smoothly and on time. If the caterers are running behind schedule, speed them up. And if the speakers are running late, I have to tackle you off stage, I'm sorry. That's how Puneet and Rajiv roll our coach hairs. I want to thank Puneet, Rimji, the entire volunteer committee, and the Sikh Centennial Board for their dedication year on year to creating a wonderful and amazing event. I hope you are amazed by the brilliant speakers tonight. And your taste buds savor the fine cuisine, you're entertained by the entertainment, and we are able to bungle the night away. So who is this Zarabar Dhaliwal they've put in front of you? Well, professionally, I'm the CEO of an NGO called Community Lab in New York. Work with the Earth Institute at Columbia University on international development and foreign direct investment. Previously, I lived in Toronto for four years, where I had the opportunity to work on the Centennial Foundation Gala in 2006. Actually, when I, the Centennial Foundation Gala has a place in my heart because I had an opportunity to meet my wife, Dave Street, during the gala. The Sixth Centennial Gala. It's the highlight for many six in the community in Toronto community here. Each year, the Sixth Centennial Gala seeks to highlight and honor accomplishments of dynamic and successful individuals who inspire and educate while giving back to the community, serving as role models and positive ambassadors of the Sixth Values. But don't take, it, don't take my word for it. Please, you can watch the video on the Centennial Foundation that will explain it all to you.
like to begin with our first speaker. Our first speaker is a man who needs no introduction. As the 24th Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty has served residents of Ontario and Canada for over 20 years. Premier McGuinty was first elected into Ontario Legislature in 1990 and he became the leader of the Liberal Party in 1996 and led this party to a majority government in 2003 and again in 2007. In his 20 years of political leadership, Dalton McGuinty has been behind important decisions that have shaped Canadian politics and is currently focused on strengthening the Ontario health care and education systems. Born on July 19, 1955, Premier McGuinty was raised in Ottawa and was one of ten children. He credits his parents and his teaching and the values and ethics that guide him as a Premier. I personally think Premier McGuinty's political savvy comes from the fact he's one of nine children. I have one brother and one sister, and I know how difficult it is. I'd like to also take this opportunity to recognize the other ministers in the room. With the Honorable Harinder Tucker, the Minister of Government. The Honorable Eric Hoskin, the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. David Zimmer, Mr. David Zimmer, the MPP of Willowdale. Dr. Kodeep Kalar, the MPP of Brimley. And the Mayor of Toronto, Rob Ford. Without further ado, I'd like to please welcome Premier Dalton McGinty on the stage. To our special honorees, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you, Zora, for that kind introduction and for serving as your MC this evening. But I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Richard Tucker, Dr. Eric Hoskins, Dr. Kuldu Kular, and David Zimmer for joining us tonight. In 2007, Harinder and Kuldu were with me when we had the awe-inspiring and humbling experience of visiting the Golden Temple in the Punja. I was the first Ontario Premier to have that honor and remains one of the highlights of my time in office. I want to thank you all for welcoming me here tonight. I'm honored to join with you in celebrating, as you have since 1997, the centennial of Sikh settlement in Canada. In particular tonight, we honor the achievements of four remarkable individuals who exemplify the principles of Sikhism. The Honorable Vim Kocher, the first person of Indo-Canadian heritage to be named the Canadian Senate. Dr. Narajan Dalla, whose research into cardiovascular diseases is helping improve people's health in Canada and indeed around the world. Susan Strong, curator and world renowned authority on the decorative arts and jewelry of the courts in India. Susan was also key in bringing the exhibition Arts of the Sikh Kin the Kingdoms from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London to this very museum in 2000. I congratulate the Sikh community for raising well over one million dollars to fund that exhibition. And our fourth honoree is Sina Ayengar, a distinguished professor and researcher with the Columbia Business School and also our keynote speaker in the evening. Congratulations to our four distinguished guests on being honored tonight for all that you have accomplished. And thank you for all that you accomplished, ladies and gentlemen, and contributed. Whether or not we are sick, each of us here tonight shares the deepest belief in the positive human qualities that are at the core of Sikhism. They are truth, compassion, contentment, humility, and love. When we think of all those who have come before us, all they have achieved, we see that it is those qualities that have guided them. Whether it was the first six to venture out and start new lives in a young country so far from their homeland more than a century ago, or whether it was our own parents, mothers and fathers who worked incredibly hard, made sacrifices for us, and gave us all that we had. They were driven by their belief in truth, compassion, contentment, humility, and love. I think of my own parents. My father taught English because that was his passion, but he taught night classes and summer school because he loved his children. My mother enjoyed working as a nurse because of her compassion, 
But she kept going for 25 years after we were all born because he wanted her children to know contentment. As you heard, I come from a family of 10 brothers and sisters, and there's a lesson that my father taught all of us. My father was a big man, six foot four, 240 pounds, and a smart guy, he had his PhD in English literature. Five kids would be sitting on the bench on this side of the table, the other five sitting on the bench on this side of the table. My father would look at all of us and say, kids, remember something, nobody here is as smart as all of us. Nobody here is as strong as all of us. I've come to see time and again just how profound and humble the truth that is. You see, you and I can't build a hospital or a school on our own. We can't secure a good quality of life on our own. We can only do it by working together. This community has always been a vital part to our shared success in Ontario. As you have prospered, we all have prospered. As you have grown, we all have grown. I want to thank you for all that you do every day to embrace the promise that is Ontario, for seeing opportunity and then seizing that opportunity. Be it in medicine, banking, private business, teaching, politics, name, just a few of the professions where sick men and women excel. You have shown us that there are no limits to the ways in which we can serve and achieve. It is in that spirit that we have made so much progress together. In our schools with higher test scores and higher graduation rates, in healthcare with lower wait times, and more than a million Ontarians who now have a family doctor. Today, more than ever, we must continue to serve and achieve. The task has fallen to us to build the next Ontario, our children's Ontario, just as our parents built our Ontario. You know, it's worth imagining how the Ontario of today would look to those sick families who first came to Canada more than a century ago. So much would be different. Technology, fashion, music. But so much would be instantly recognizable. Our cultural traditions, our languages, above all else, our beliefs, those essential values that unite us as Ontarians and define us as human beings. Tonight we celebrate those beliefs and what they make it possible for us to do, which is to achieve great things with each other, for each other. Thank you for all that you are doing to build up our cause. Thank you for sharing with yourselves. Thank you for honoring others. Because of all that you do, together, we are ensuring that Ontario remains what it has always been and always will be, the greatest province and the best country in the world. Thank you, Premier McGinty. Coming from a country where the political capital bears a striking resemblance to a frat house, and uh, the mainstream media now has turned into more entertainment than news, it's refreshing to hear politician dedicated to the issues. Now we'd like to introduce our keynote, Dr. Sheena Anker, the inaugural ST Lee Professor of Business at the Columbia Business School and the Research Director for the Jerome A. Shazen Institute of International Business. Even though Dr. Anker and I share a college campus at Columbia, it was only recently that I came across her work on choice through her TED Talk video. Dr. Eindra has been blazing new trails in the academic area of choice since her early work at Stanford during her graduate degree while doing the JAM study, and most recently, her new book, The Art of Choosing. She is fast becoming the Malcolm Gladwell of choice. But Dr. Eindra wasn't always a high saloon academic, author turned celebrity. Her roots are very similar to our own. She was born to an immigrant family here in Toronto, grew up in Queens, Flushing, Queens, New York, and her father was, had helped put together the first good life. Dr. Iyengar's first introduction to choice was growing up in a bicultural environment, observing the tenets of Sikhism while her family partaking, her family and partaking in American culture as well. This is something many of us in this room can connect with the dichotomy of those two right realities. 
Dr. Iger's presence is a unique honor this evening. It's the first time in, that I can recall our keynote is also an honor. So without further ado, I'd like to present the video of Dr. Iger and call her to the stage. is the inaugural ST Lee Professor of Business at Columbia Business School and Research Director at the Jerome H. Hazen Institute of International Business. Dr. Anger was born to seek parents in Toronto before moving to New York. Despite losing her sight to a genetic condition, Dr. Anger has achieved astounding success. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics, a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, and a PhD in Social Psychology from Stanford University. Dr. Iyengar is a world-renowned expert on choice. Her recent book, The Art of Choosing, explores how we make choices and why they're so powerful. Her other research and teaching interests include globalization and entrepreneurial creativity. Dr. Iyengar's work has been featured in premier academic journals across economics, psychology, marketing, and management. Her dissertation was awarded the prestigious Best Dissertation Award from the Society of Experimental Social Psychology. She also received the Presidential Early Career Award for Social Scientists for her research on cultural differences in decision making. Her work is commonly featured in popular media including Fortune Magazine, New York Times, Wall Street Journal and The Time Magazine. Dr. Sheena Iyengar. I'm 
my parents were told that I would probably go blind by the time I was in high school. You know, you might say that such negative events make one resilient. Or you might say that it's the resilient to which such things happen. Regardless, even the resilient can have the wind completely knocked out of them. When I was 13, I woke up one morning and was kind of miffed at my dad. Like, like most kids are when they're teenagers. My father woke up that morning with a bit of leg pain, reading troubles. My mother made him promise he would go to the doctor that day. Maybe he intended to. Um, by that afternoon, though, he collapsed outside a bar in Manhattan. By the, time he was, by the time he actually got to the hospital, he'd already had three heart attacks and was gone. This is not to say that our lives are solely shaped by random and unpleasant events. But they do seem to move, for better or for worse, along largely unmapped terrain. How, how well can we really plan our future when we can only see so far? And the weather changes faster than you can say a surprise. But wait. I have another story for you. In this sentiment, I'm going to tell you the story of my life again. But it's the story that every single one of us in this room shares. My parents left India and came to North America in search of a better life. Themselves, kids, in essence, they were searching for the North American dream. Like many others before them, after them, they brought with them a culture created a country within a country. But as someone who grew up in this part of the world, I think I understood that dream almost better than they did. I understood that at the center of that dream would shine so bright that even I, as a blind person, could see it with choice. You know, any one of us, if we're asked, how did you go from here to there? What is the story of your life? Any of us could tell the story of our lives in terms of fate, chance, or choice. In fact, you could tell the story of your life in all three ways. And each time you tell the story, you would uncover some new truth about yourself and your life. And I think there's something special when you tell the story of your life in terms of choice. Because when you tell the story of your life in terms of choice, it gives meaning to everything you say and do. Ultimately, choice is the only one of these forces that puts control in your hands. It's the only thing that enables you to go from who you are today to whom you want to be tomorrow. Regardless of what fate and chance may have in store for you, you are ultimately evaluated by the choices that you make. But for God's sake, how do you make these choices? You know, as the words would say, it's a bloody difficult process. Well, let me tell you, it's even more difficult than you were seeking more. Being a Sikh American, not only do you have to keep track of two cultures, two languages, and in my case, it wasn't just Punjabi, it was some polluted form of Hindi, there was some mix of Punjabi and Hindi. Then on the other hand, you can but you have this other layer that's thrust upon you. You're getting two entirely different ways of life. Languages, you might say, of choice. You know, as a Sikh, you know, you follow the five Ks, you learn that you need to have your duties, understand that choice has consequences. You have to respect your parents, respect your elders, respect your community, respect the wishes of God. Understand that when you make a choice, you have to consider the ramifications for other people. Don't be so selfish. Don't embarrass people. Don't shame people. And of course, your parents, your aunts and uncles, they all had an arranged marriage. That's normal. And of course, a good child marries within the community. And of course, when you choose a career, it should be done so with the consultation of your parents. It's a good thing to do. And the ideal, of course, is doctor and engineer. And the secret you learn is that there are limitations.
invitations to choice. And with choice comes responsibilities. And of course, there's the American approach. You mean to tell me you can't cut your hair? Oh my god, that sounds so unfair. Oh, and your parents, they met each other for the first time on their wedding night? That's horrific. I would die if that would happen to me. As far as I can tell, my parents didn't quite look on the verge of death. You know, as an American, you're supposed to know who you are. Everything about you is supposed to be completely custom made. You're supposed to figure out who you want to be, how you're going to dress, what you're going to grow up to be, and absolutely choose your spouse. So as an American, choice means possibilities, opportunities. It's an exercise in making yourself. So how am I supposed to choose? I've always envied those who were just Sikhs or just Americans. It seems like a much easier lifestyle, you know? If you're a Sikh, you're comfortable in who you are and what your ideas and values are, and, you know, yeah, Americans offer some good things, you know, but they're a little bit misguided. And then as Americans, it's like, yeah, you know, we, we respect people from different cultures, and, you know, certainly we honor diversity, but, you know, our way is the more right way, and other people are, well, that's just interesting. Now, as a Sikh American, gosh, how you take sides? It's really tough, you know? And then you try to convince the other side of the other side's point of view. And by the way, that's a hopeless exercise. They try convincing a Westerner that arranged marriage is actually good. And at best, you're like, okay, well, I guess it works for them. Try convincing an Aki that, you know, if they fall in love and that person is not the right kind of person, but, you know, it might actually be great. Max, you might get it's acceptable, maybe. Right? Well, so it's complicated being a Sikh American. How do you decide? How do you make the choice? You're told you're supposed to find the perfect things from Sikhs and the perfect things from Americans and create that ideal combination. But how, who gets to decide what's the perfect stuff? Well, then add to that the com complication of being blind. A whole new layer of complexity to this whole idea of having choice. So when I was in school, I remember our teachers used to tell us that you can grow up and do and be whatever it is that your mind and heart wants you to be. So when my teacher asked and went around the room and said, you know, what do you guys want to be when you grow up? I raised my hand and said, well, I'd like to be a pilot. <laughs> yeah, all the other kids had the same reaction. <laughs> The teacher paused. I don't think she knew what to say. She's like, oh, that's very interesting, child. At some point, I realized I needed more than my mind and heart to do this. Well, the question kept coming at me, right? What are you going to do? And, you know, mom, I'm like, oh, my God, who's going to marry her? What's going to happen to her? Oh, my God, gonna, what's going to happen to her? What were the options? I looked around with them. I spent some time in Spain. In Spain, you know, random people would come up to me and hand me money in my hand, and then suddenly they would expect me to hand them a lottery ticket in return. Apparently in Spain, blind people have the corner on lottery tickets. <laughs> and when I went to Japan, I spent some time there. Everywhere I went, people would come up to me, take my hands, like random people, put my hands on their back, shoulders, and expect me to do a massage. I didn't know anything about even getting a massage. And then, of course, in the U.S., you know, what's the idea? Well, you know, Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, it's got to be a musician. So I tried out for a for a few years. It didn't quite work out. And then, when some people thought, well, okay, she can go to college, well, then the choice was obvious what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Lawyer! Justice is blind! <laughs> well, as I was growing up, I started to develop this awareness of how so many of our hopes, dreams, expectations struggle constantly against our limitations. That was true for all of us. And one of the big challenges we all have in life is we're trying to figure out how to overcome those limitations. And that meant that we needed to be able to separate our true limitations from our perceived wants. So, here you had a complicated package. 
blind Sikh American. How does she choose? And I think that I was actually blessed. You know, as a Sikh, the message I learned was that you don't ask the question, what do you want to be? That's a dumb question. As a Sikh, what I learned was that you're supposed to ask, what could you be? What could you be good at? As an American, what I learned was that Yeah. 